So, hello everybody and welcome to Vector Software's webinar series. In today's webinar we are talking about do modern multi-core systems meet the requirements of ISO 26262? This is a joint webinar of Cisco and Vector Software. I'm your host, Winfried Schröder. I'm Business Development Manager at Vector Software and I will moderate this webinar today. Our guest presenter today is Chris Berg, the Solutions Architect at Cisco. Good morning. Hello, Chris. Good morning. Our other presenter today is Ingo Niklas, Field Application Engineer here at Vector Software. Hello, Ingo. Hello, everyone. So before we want to start, I want to make sure that all attendees are able to follow the webinar today. We recommend to use a free audio broadcast with your speakers or headset, but you can use also one of the international phone numbers to connect to this webinar. All attendees are muted. You can ask questions using the questions window at any time. We will answer all received questions at the QA session at the end of this webinar. Our agenda for today. I'm going to start with a little overview about Vector Software and our solutions. Chris will then tell you some important things about the use of multi-core systems in ISO 26262 environments. After that, Ingo will give you a live demo. At the end of this webinar, we will answer all questions you send us. So, some words about us. Vector Software is a US-based company. It was founded in 1990 by two software engineers. They tested software that had to be certified for DO 178. Since the testing of software is a rather unpleasant but also a very generic task, they came up with the idea to write a program for automated, automated software testing. In 1994, the first version of Vectorcast was published. Well, why is this information important? Vectorcast has been designed from the very beginning for the testing of embedded software and it's always used for testing of safety critical applications. Where you can find us? Our headquarters is located in East Greenridge, Rhode Island. That is between Boston and New York on the east coast of the US. My colleague and I sit here in Germany in the very nice city of Kempen, which is located close to Düsseldorf. We have also a global network of subdiaries and distributors. We have customers in nearly all industries. Previously, our customers came primarily from the aerospace, rail, and defense. The highest growth rates we have today in the automotive, medical, and industrial automation industry. This is due to the different standards of the functional safety, which is a driver for almost all industries to develop safe and secure software by rigorous software testing. At a high level, Vectorcast impacts your business with three things. First, it improves the software quality. It reduces the time to market with faster test results and it lowers the life cycle cost because less errors get in the field and therefore the cost for maintenance, redesign and reuse are lowered. Some of our key technologies are unit and integration test automation, code coverage, continuous integration with change-based testing, agile test-driven development support, and embedded target support. If you have a look on the traditional view model, you see that the vector car solutions are on the right and at the button, which is all about testing from system to unit testing. What you can see is that Vectorcast integrates with all of the tools you probably have in your ecosystem. For example, tools for requirements management, LM tools, modeling tools, or tools for static analysis. As you can see too, Vectorcast integrates to nearly all embedded compiler in the market. The way we are looking at software development and software tests in particular has an evolutionary approach. Some organizations are doing nothing or very little, but everybody is doing some kind of system testing and probably checks code coverage to see what, where they are with their testing. 
We help organizations to get started on the left and move forward to the right side and optimize the quality of their software. So, that's it from my side. I would like to hand over the microphone and the screen to Chris from Cisco. Thank you, Vinny. So, let me switch over here. So, good morning, everybody, in this uh, webinar um, about uh, how do multi core systems you know, uh, work in the ISO 26262 environments. Um, I'm a solutions architect at uh, Cisco and I'm responsible for the automotive customers and the technical communication uh, to the, our customers out there. I will also start off with a short company overview so that you get an idea of what um, Cisco is doing. Um, we were founded in uh, 1991. I uh, have our headquarters in Mainz in Germany and are currently about 110 uh, employees. Since uh, 2012, we're an independent part of the Thales Group, um, so working uh, for a uh, large European um, company here. We have facilities in Germany, France and the Czech Republic, where we do all of our um, development and customer um, projects. Our two main uh, products are, uh, first of all, PyQuest, which is a safe and secure um, hypervisor. The uh, speciality of PyQuest is that it's certifiable, and especially we have already done some certification in multi-core systems in the past. Our second product is Elinos, our embedded industrial Linux distribution. Here we support um, Linux running standalone on various different platforms, but Elinos is also prepared to run as a guest in PyQuest. The third part of our business is um, services. So we uh, provide services to our customers in the area of BSP development, but as well as support during the complete phase of a certification if that is required. So let's get to the point and the topic of our today's seminar. So how do multi-core, modern multi-core systems meet the requirements of the ISO 26262? First of all, let's find out what is the definition of a certification. Certification is a characterization of uh, an object, person, or organization, and that is usually proven by some kind of external review and assessment. This process is usually a very um, complicated process, a lot of discussions are going on between the auditors and the um, and, and, and us uh, trying to certify a product, but usually we get into agreement and uh, afterwards we have a successful project. Certification is quite complex. It's not writing the source code which is the complex part of certification. It's more all of the things you have to do um, around um, to get uh, to the point where you can really certify. So the whole planning requirements and verification is a lot more uh, work than the actual source code itself. As you see here uh, in a small example that we have provided from, the, uh, from our certification of the Airbus A400M. So more than 7.3 times more test code than source code were actually written. And not only that, there is a whole lot of standards out there. So avionics, rail, automotive, medical industry, they all have their own variant of uh, certification standards. And we have to cover all of these to, certify, to help uh, customers certify in all these different areas. So what do you need to be certified? First of all, there's organizational needs. You have to have a quality management and quality assurance uh, processes in place. You have to um, have life cycle processes and other management uh, 
um, process in place to have an organizational setup that supports certification. Then there's the project and the product side. Of course, doing a certification project means that you have to be compliant to all of the company related processes, uh, such as the life cycle, producing the life cycle data and following the quality assurance and management processes that have been established. Of course, we also have to conform to the safety related requirements from the specific um, certification that we're going to follow. The customer also has his demands. He wants us to follow the um, development in his specific domain. And of course, in the end, we need to integrate into his the environment as well. So after all these more generic terms, how does PyQuest fit into the ISO 26262 environment. If you look at the ISO 26262, we have several parts and specifically part six and part eight um, are the most valid parts concerning software requirements. So we have checked against those and see if our processes match uh, what the um, certification uh, requires from us. From a PyCos point of view, we provide um, all the planning documents, all the software documentation, uh, reaching from the high-level requirement down to the source code. Specifically here, we can mention the traceability, where we can really follow requirements through all levels of documentation from high level down to source code and back. We also produce safety-related documentation, such so as the safety case and the safety manual. So PyQuest provides all the necessary support to really um, fulfill the 26, ISO 26262 requirements. Putting it in a different view, here you see the traditional V model, specifically here augmented with the chapter numbers of the ISO 26262. And we've checked that all of the different parts are fulfilled by the certification kit that we can provide for our um, safe and secure hypervisor. PyQuest has been certified to a lot of different standards already, specifically in the transportation area. Uh, we have done a multi-core certification. We have a project uh, that has been certified through the ISO 26262 already, and then others in the avionics and industrial area. Keep in mind that all this is done with the same product, so we do not have different PyQuest versions per, um, per, per market, but all this is coming from the same code base, uh, which enables us to um, yeah, carry over uh, all the testing and uh, planning uh, and, and documents from one standard to another, and only adapting to the specifics of the um, industry requirements. So coming to the example I want to show today, um, how does a multi-core platform behave or how, what things do you need to consider when going to a multi-core certification? Here's an example of a very simple, just dual core setup. It's pretty standard. Most of you might have seen a similar kind of, um, of architecture. We have two cores here. Uh, sharing a level two cache, sharing uh, the main memory. And um, at first sight, the question is, so what are the concerns a certification authority can have against or for such a system? First of all, there are hardware interference channels. So whenever there's resources in the hardware that need to be uh, shared between two or more cores, there is a potential of somehow interfering with uh, the execution of the other cores or the other cores uh, doing something that uh, is interfering with my um, own uh, execution on uh, the core that my process is running on. Then there's the SOC design. Uh, many of the today's multi-core processors are big system on chips with a lot of peripherals, mostly done targeted at, at, at consumer um, projects, so not really um, targeted for industrial or safety applications. 
So we have to check if there are sufficient safety features, sufficient robustness against uh, single event upsets, and also if there is a possibility to, to, to detect and correct a single or multi-bit error, so if the SOC supports ECC on the external DRAM, for example. Design assurance is also a big topic. Sometimes uh, SOC vendors do not disclose all the documentation of their processor design. So there might be undetected um, interference channels that pop up during testing or um, uh, lifetime of the product. So this is also something that we need to keep in mind when certifying a multi-core system. And then the in-service history, well, of course, we all know multi-core designs since a couple of years now, but they have not been so widely used as single core systems. So here, there's still experience that is being built up um, for, uh, for multi-core systems. Yeah. So coming back to our example, our little dual core here. Um, so what are the interference channels we can find here? First of all, let's look at the caches. The level one caches are per core, so they are uncritical in this regard, but the level two cache is shared between the CPU. To keep the level one caches in sync, we have to implement some kind of coherency. Here, the coherency module also is a shared resource because it is responsible for both of the two cores level one caches. We have shared buses, a shared processor to memory bus, shared PCI buses, we have shared devices. So all this um, needs to be considered. And of course, uh, determinism can then still be somehow uh, disturbed by behavior that might not be controllable through software. Some cores have automatic refill mechanisms uh, or uh, some bus arbitration that is built into the, the, the device that you have to keep in mind when um, deploying a multi-core system. For this presentation, I have chosen to have a deeper look at the cache architecture and see how that influences um, the interference or creates the interference channels we were talking about. Consider this small example here. Um, it's quite simple. We have a global variable um, that creates an array with the, as big as the number of cores here. And each of the cores runs this little program, just pretty much incrementing its own um, core ID uh, here and then just running through this loop. From the point of view of the caches, we have this variable might be located such that it just overlaps two cache lines. Um, it can happen because you let the compiler just do what it wanted while allocating the space. So here uh, we now see what we call a false sharing of the cache. Although we don't really share any data, every core is incrementing his own um, his own uh, integer here. But as they are uh, linked together by this global variable, um, other cores see a dependency here. We have looked at this kind of dependency um, on two different x86 uh, cores, one Intel, one AMD core. And the first uh, test was to see how does the bandwidth behave when you read and write to um, disjoint data regions. So here there's no sharing at all between uh, the two cores. Um, and if you look at this black line here, it shows how the bandwidth varies with larger um, read and write block sizes uh, when the second core is actually switched off. So here the first core is just alone in the system and you can see a perfectly uh, shaped uh, curve here. Actually, you can really read how, find out how large the different cache hierarchies are. So the fastest is the level one cache, pretty much 32 kilobyte for this Intel system. Then they have put the large L2 cache here, and then trailing out back here, you see the performance of the main memory system. Curve looks similar to the in, in the AMD part. AMD seems to have chosen a larger L1 cache, but then compromised using a smaller L2 cache. So that's a design choice that every vendor does for himself. 
So when you switch on reads and writes of non-shared data on the second core, you see that the performance degrades a little bit for larger um, data sizes, which is okay because now the level two cache is used by two cores, so you share cache memory. Uh, each core has only pretty much half of the L2 for itself. But the, the form of the curve does not change. So you see a, a degrade of the uh, memory performance, but not any erratic behavior. That changes dramatically when we go to a scenario where we have shared data regions between the cores. Again, the black line shows you the um, performance when the second core is off, but as soon as the second core comes online and reads or uh, writes data, we have very undeterministic behavior here and we can't really say what is happening and what my performance will be because it's highly dependent on the actions of the second core in the system. How can I manage such a scenario in a certification environment? Well, we want to be in control of the system. That's the first point. So we want to statically partition CPU cores. Load balancing is good to have a high utilization of the system, but it takes away control and might create unforeseen problems, such as shown in the previous slides. We want to control the access to shared resources. We want to be able to really tell which um, process is currently using uh, a resource. We want to limit maybe the uh, reach of different applications to be sure that we have the system under control. You want to eliminate the false sharing. Um, so maybe depending on the level of certification that you have to reach, you want to avoid multi-core applications in the first place. Uh, or at least you want to ensure proper data alignment such that we don't create false sharing by accident. The last point is more targeted at us as the OS developer. Um, things in the kernel can also create um, interference uh, with uh, the execution of a critical process. For example, a kernel global lock uh, might uh, introduce non-deterministic non behavior in such a system. So how can PyCoS help control the um, resources uh, of a specific hardware? So um, after the bootloader brings up the board and starts PyQuest, the PyQuest kernel boots and takes control over the platform. Uh, so we are, PyQuest is a so-called uh, level one hypervisor, meaning that is this running directly on the hardware. Uh, we have two support packages that actually help us um, contain a generic microkernel, but still be portable to many different architectures. So the architecture support package um, abstracts the microkernel from the specific architecture, processor architecture, like uh, x86, ARM, or PowerPCs, for example. And then the platform support package uh, focuses on the specifics of a specific board or platform. The PyQuest system software this is the second part of our uh, RTOS. Here uh, we have all the different mechanisms to create uh, partitions to monitor the writes and the configuration that you have uh, set up during configuration time. PyQuest can support guests such as Linux, Android, or Altazar, either in a para-virtualized form or if the hardware allows and supports this in hardware virtualized form here. Uh, you need hardware support from the processor to um, use this mode uh, it gives you a performance benefit, but pretty much only the larger ARM cores or x86 cores have this uh, support. There's several other uh, APIs that do not contain a complete OS. You can natively run applications on PyQuest, which is usually necessary when you go to higher uh, certification levels. We have a POSIX environment. You can have a system partition that controls the whole environment, is able to restart different partitions independently of others. And we can put drivers into partitions, which is a good uh, 
place for them to reside because if a driver uh, has a problem it will not affect any of the other parts of the system it will be contained just to this partitions it is possible to locate drivers at other parts in the systems but here you are then under the regulations of the certification because you have to then test your drivers to the highest level that you want to reach during your certification effort so now we have our resources pretty much contained so we can control how much uh, memory is available to each of these partitions we can control the access to cpus to peripherals so the resource part um, is covered what about the timing let's look at a multi-core system and set up uh, some constraints here uh, we have in this example four partitions which we have configured in our uh, RTOS. Uh, we have also configured three time partitions um, in PyQuest you can connect or uh, time partitions to resource partitions so uh, resource partition one for example runs in time partition one resource partition one also has access to two cores while Resource partition two has access to three cores. Resource partition um, three and four only uh, have uh, access to one core each. All of them are located inside different time partitions. So how does this look during a runtime uh, phase? So during the execution time of the first time partitions, we see that um, resource partitions one and four are allowed to run. So given the core allocation that we have configured, resource partition one runs on two cores and resource partition four runs on one core. In the next time partition, uh, we can then run our resource partition number two, which has access to all three cores. And now the important part is here for our red critical application, we have reserved one core and one time partition to eliminate all the effects that we might have from any sharing of the memory architecture for example so here we can guarantee that there is no interference from any of the other cores but because for this specific short period of time we have pretty much isolated our critical application to run as if it were a standalone single core setup um, this might look uh, wasteful to people using uh, or, or or being used to to uh, yeah running in load balance systems or so but under certification aspects this is um, still an efficient use of a multi-core systems because in the early days of implementing multi-core applications uh, or multi-core chips um, into for example avionics uh, people really shut down other cores and held only one running the whole period of time so here we can use a hypervisor to actually manage uh, the usage of a system in a way that we can have critical applications running next to uncritical applications so mixing different AC levels in the same system on the same SOC becomes possible I want to close my presentation with a short summary so PyQuest is certification ready for the ISO 26262. We can create a mixed safety and security environment, making it possible to run different levels of criticality next to each other. So you can have a Linux running next to a uh, uh, an application that needs certification in a PyQuest native partition, for example. Uh, we can create uh, partitions with different and various APIs so you can run old legacy Autozar uh, applications next to a Linux or a POSIX application that is then in the certification path. With the control uh, of our uh, of the system done typically by the, the hypervisor we can also change this, the, the, the timing schedule and provide fast boot functionality by bringing up critical partitions first and once they have been started and established for example their CAN communication to the car we can then go ahead and boot the PyQuest uh, or the Linux applications 
uh, at a later point in time. Last but not least, also your time to market uh, is getting better because once you are in contact with third party suppliers, maybe that uh, develops specific parts of your product, uh, you can locate them into a partition where they have a defined set of resources that are fully under your control. So you can eliminate a lot of dependencies and limit the error propagation from external software, for example. Thank you very much for taking the time to listening to my presentation and I'd like to hand over to <clears throat> Thank you Chris for your presentation. I will give this presentation now over to Ingo and you see already his lucky face on your screen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Winnie. Yeah, my name is Ingo Niklas. Um, that's the name to the lucky face. I'm field application engineer at Vector Software. That means I'm responsible for um, technical support for Vectorcast. I'm also doing um, trainings and going to exhibitions and doing demos to prospects. So today I want to tell you something about how Vectorcast can help you in this um, PyCoS environment. And what I got in, in preparation of this webinar was um, I got the uh, a PyCoS license and I got um, Codeo, the IDE, and um, the question is how can we help? So there are different areas in this PyCoS architecture where you can add your own um, source code. There's this application part, there are other drivers or kernel parts that can be extended with your own code. And the question is how to how to help with testing. And one thing that Vectorcast can help with is we can provide code coverage. So usually when you do system level testing, when you test the functionality of your um, application, when you test against requirements, for example, um, then you test the whole application in total on the embedded hardware, but you have no idea which, which line of code is executed usually. Um, or which line of code is not executed. And that's the interesting information. We want to know which line was executed. How does Vectorcast measure code coverage? We use source code instrumentation. That means we add additional lines to your source code. Then you use the instrumented versions of your source code, compile and link, and do the system test with these instrumented um, source code files. Um, and as a result, we can give you the following. We can give you code coverage information. We can tell you which line was executed, which line was not executed. We can give you code coverage trends. Um, we can show you the lines in the reports. And we can also give you some information on cyclomatic complexity, what's the, the more complex part of your software, and also how well is the, the, the complex part of your software tested, how many um, lines of code were executed in the in the risky part of your software. So those are um, important informations. Um, and what we can also do with this information is we can do something called change-based testing. So the first thing that you can do with code coverage is um, well, you're you're free to to measure the the code coverage in the way that you want. You can, for example, have only one code coverage file from all the system testing that you did can be a system test of three weeks and just one code coverage file. But what you can also do is you, you can test more granular. That, that means you, you can, for example, um, look at the code coverage for the test of one requirement and then save the code coverage. And then you clear the code coverage and test the code coverage for the next requirement. So like this, you get a requirements traceability traceability to the source code, you know which line in the software was necessary to to execute this requirement or to implement this, re um, this requirement. And this gives you a requirement source code traceability that is, for example, um, requested or um, highly recommended um, by some certification authorities. So this is one thing that we can provide. And what we can do with this information is we can do something called change-based testing. That means if you do a source code change, then which part of your system test do you have to, to do again? Is it everything? 
to, or is it just a, a few of your tests that are affected by this source code change? And this is something that Vectorcast can tell you. So from the source code change, we know which system test needs to be re-executed, and maybe it's, it's just 10% of your system tests, so you can save 90% of the time, and you don't have to execute all your system tests again. And if you think about uh, manual system tests and, and how much effort it is to, to do them, and um, then this can can save uh, some time in, in your testing process. So this is how Vectorcast can help with system level testing. We can give you code coverage information. And the other um, question was, how can we help with unit or integration level testing? And in unit testing, it's, it's not so relevant that the, the hardware has uh, multiple cores. The, the unit test application usually runs on one single core. And then um, what I got is um, Codeo and, and PyCoS, and um, the IDE comes together with QAMU, the, the uh, quick emulator. And what I will show you now is how to run a unit test um, application or how to do unit testing um, with PyCoS, but I'm not using real hardware, I'm using the quick emulator. Then um, Vectorcast. Um, the unit test executable runs as, an, um, as a native application in this user space. And what do we need to build this unit test application? Well, the first thing is um, you pick a file that you want to test, usually isolated from the rest of the code. And then Vectorcast builds all the, the framework around this, this uh, C file and that builds the unit test executable. We automatically build the test driver with a main and with a code that call the function in this uh, C file. Vectorcast also builds automatically stubs or mocks or fakes or however you want to call them. Um, and those are smart stubs. You can tell them to, to check values, to check parameters that are passed to the stub and you can tell the stubs to return specific values. And then you're also free to add real code like um, library functions or um, everything that comes from your compiler, malloc, uh, string compare, whatever, or any startup code that might be necessary to, to boot up the hardware. And um, then the real test data is separated from the unit test executable. We have a data-driven unit, um, unit test executable and um, the, the unit tests can be executed on PyCoS, on the embedded hardware, or on the quick emulator. And of course, we also have this functionality, this, this change-based testing. So if you change source code, we can tell you which unit test is affected by the source code change, and also which test case is affected by the source code change. Part of, of them, only those that um, are related or that are against the function that changed in a specific source code file. So that's what I want to demo now. Quick live demo of um, um, yeah, doing a unit test in a PyCoS environment. So what we see here is um, Vectorcast Manage. It helps you to manage all the test environments in your project. Um, I have uh, three unit test environments and I have two integration test environments, so it's a very small example. A no system test could be uh, managed with Vectorcast Manage 2. Uh, this is the, the project view. We also have the files view where we see the files that are uh, and look at the code coverage. Um, that we already achieved in our testing efforts. This gives us the code coverage for this C file, but code coverage from different test environments. This C file is part of one unit test environment, and it's also part of an integration test environment, and we can show the aggregate code coverage from all the testing efforts on this one C file. For example, we see uh, green lines for lines that were executed, uh, red lines for lines that were not executed, and if we wanted to increase code coverage, for example, we want to execute this stake part, then we can add an additional unit test. We can um, open the environment file, the unit test environment file, or the unit test environment on that file, and look at 
the functions that are implemented in this file. We see that there already are some test cases. Um, a test case is just a call of a function. We have access to the interface parameters. We have access to global variables. Um, we have access to the stops that VectorCast built. We can tell the stops to verify values or to return specific values. So if we wanted to, to exercise the stake uh, case, we can just duplicate the test case um, and then change um, this entry from chicken to steak and then re-execute. And now this executes the unit test application as a native application in Pike OS. So we really execute the code, let's say, on the real hardware, but in my case, it's on the quick emulator, so on, on Cremo. We see that the job is running and it is finished and we see an execution re, um, result. We call the function that we wanted to test. We have some events for the stops that were called and we, we did some checks and passed all the checks. So we're happy. We should see additional code coverage now also for the stake part in the um, source file or in the <coughs> code coverage viewer. Um, so what happened under the cover is we called a batch file that executed um, this unit test executable in PyCoS, and, and this is the output of the batch file. So we see um, that, that we did some copying um, somewhere. A quick emulator is started. I think this is the line where, where Quemo is started and where the um, native application was um, executed in PyCoS. Then um, the native application produces some output, and we store this output in a file, and this file is used in, in the VectorCast GUI to build the reports and to show the code coverage. So we can close this unit test environment, then uh, we can integrate the new test case into our manage environment, and we can, for example, um, now do an incremental rebuild. Um, let's say let's, let's execute all test cases that need to be executed or rebuild all environments that need to be rebuilt, and um, fortunately there's nothing to do. We did not change any source code, so we we did not need to rebuild anything, and we can also keep the results of the test cases that we already executed. So if we just change one test case, we would have executed just one test case. Um, when we look at reporting, what do we get? Well, we have a widget that shows you code coverage on your project. Um, for example, all the files that are part of your um, test environments, we see the functions, we can um, sort, we can also sort for um, cyclomatic complexity, so we can focus on the most complex functions, for example. We can also filter and say only show me um, functions with a cyclomatic complexity more than three and code coverage less than 30% and then focus on, on those functions and increase the code coverage and increase the number of test cases, for example. Um, if you are more interested in reporting, then we have something, um, we have a, a dashboard that can present you all the, the testing effort, or all the testing data that, that we have uh, in, in the project. And um, the dashboard can run, for example, um, on your build server. Uh, if you use continuous integration, you have a build server. Um, then you can use the, the dashboard on that build server and the clients can connect to the build server and, and look at the information that is presented. And the information can, can look somehow like this. It's just a small application. It's, it's not the best example, but it gives you an idea of what we can show. We, we can show you some, some metrics, how many functions, how many statements, what's the code coverage, what's the average uh, complexity, but sometimes it's not the average complexity that you're interested in. It's, it's more the highlights, the, the most complex functions, the, the most complex uh, files. We see that we also have um, complexity um, sorted uh, by functions, for example. Here we see which is the most complex function. And in the middle we see how good our testing is related to the code size, that's what the block on the left side shows us, or related to the cyclomatic complexity, that's the blocks on the right side. So not necessarily a, a very big block, is also a very complex block, but complex blocks are hard to test. So in our example, the manager.c file is not only big in 
APIs that has many statements, it's also the most complex file in our source code. So we should focus our testing efforts on this file and we can also look more granular into the file and see which functions are tested well and which functions are badly tested or poorly tested. So we see uh, we um, the color tells us that green is well covered code, so usually well tested code, and the, the red functions were not executed at all or um, not enough. Um, so we should increase the number of test cases on those functions. So this is one example of how we can present the data in your project or in, in, your, in, in any flavors of tests that you're doing on, on your code. We can also look at, for example, um, we, we can do a risk analyze um, depending on the cyclomatic complexity. So this is a, a very um, simple application with cyclomatic complexity less than 10. Um, if you have higher complexities, um, cyclomatic complexities, like 20 or 30 or 40, then it's, it's more likely to have a bug in those areas. And we can not only show you in this pie chart um, how big the, the piece of pie is in, in this area of um, cyclomatic complexity, we can also show you how well this part is tested or covered. So how well are those lines executed. So the, the dashboard has um, different views onto the, the data in your test environment and it's also configurable so if you have other ideas of how to present this data um, you can also implement some new um, dashboard views. For example this one shows us results of the static code analyze, how many uh, percentage of clean functions in the different C files so um, um, the the um, static code analyze did not complain about any functions in manager driver, but there is not one single clean function in manager.c, so maybe we, we should uh, recode parts of the software. So far from my side, that's all I wanted to show. If you have any questions, feel free to add them to the questions panel. And now back to Winnie. Yes, thank you. Ingo and Chris for your presentations. Um, as Ingo said, it's now time uh, for the Q&A session. Uh, feel free to send us questions you probably have using this questions window on the right. I would like to start with Chris. Chris, do you have any questions you would like to answer already? Yes, actually, there's quite a few coming in here. Um, so let's start with the first one. I'll just walk through them as they showed up here on my screen. Uh, the question was, what are pure hardware-specific requirements in the ISO 26262? Um, well, we're a software company, so I can't really talk a lot about uh, the hardware requirements. Um, usually, if you have a SOC or a vendor that is focused to provide um, his products or SOCs into a safety environment, then they usually also provide a safety manual uh, or a safety case that describes certain setups or uh, issues with their hardware. So that's something that you would get typically from your hardware vendor. In this safety manual, the hardware vendor might require uh, cyclic testing or resetting of registers or other uh, self-tests that may be necessary uh, to be implemented in the software uh, design. So here is where we can help again, and this is what we have done for several customers already, um, to do some checking of hardware, you know, creating CRC checksums over certain RAM areas to uh, to verify if the um, code running there uh, is not damaged in any way. So these kind of things is where we can help and aid uh, in, uh, in cooperating with the hardware. But generally, um, we uh, as the software component do not are not in the situation where we can be responsible for the complete system setup. So that again goes back to the responsibility of the um, of the uh, producer of the system. So he would need to then come up with requirements for the software in order to uh, make his system uh, safety case 
uh, valid. So there's a lot of interaction between hardware, software, and system. Uh, and uh, so that's, I think, where uh, we have a lot of experience, but we do not define any hardware-specific requirements from our point of view as the software vendor. Um, <clears throat> Second question I have here is, um, what about security? Uh, you may be locating code in different locations. Uh, correct. Uh, safety and security have uh, a lot in common. Um, there are a lot of uh, standard approaches that you can take. Uh, and as this, we also call our product a secure um, hypervisor. Uh, you might be familiar with a security concept called MILS, which is uh, abbreviation for multiple independent levels of security. Here, the approach is to separate uh, problems into smaller controllable pieces and parts. So that's where PyCoS can come in very handy with, with its partitioning concept. It's very easy now to split up um, for example, a communication to the outside, maybe you have a device connected to the internet, so you can have a partition that is communicating uh, to, the, uh, to the outside world, but has no access to any of the inside uh, communication peripherals, such as maybe a CAN bus, SPI, or any other uh, relevant uh, system. So you can then uh, control the communications channels from the outside by maybe implementing a firewall partition or only accepting certain message types that you allow to be transferred to a more critical part of your system. So that's where, uh, where a separation uh, OS like uh, PyCoS can come in uh, very handy in supporting security uh, setups. Third question before I hand over to Ingo again uh, was that um, does PyQuest support redundant execution of code and modules with voting? So typically here, uh, people would see you know, two out of three voters or, or such things like that, where you have systems that run in parallel and then uh, there is uh, one voting station that then compares the outputs of the individual parts. This is usually a very a uh, very project-specific setup um, that needs to be dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis. We have experience in these kind of setups. Um, we have a solution, for example, for a standard module, which comes from, I guess, MEM, that's the D602, which is a voter system uh, in a standard uh, setup based on x86 systems, usually used in transportation uh, devices such as trains or so. Um, so here we do have an implementation where PyCos runs um, on both the, the clients and the voting and communicates these events. So uh, it depends on the hardware setup, it depends on your project, but we can support these kind of things. Ingo, do you want to take over with some of your questions? Yes, please. Um, there are some questions. Well, the, um, the first thing I want to tell is that obviously there was an audio issue, so obviously because the sound was not perfect. Um, it's in the in the um, uh, in the chat or in the answers already that we will provide a recording of this webinar. So if you had any audio issues, then sorry for that. Um, the audio on the recording should be fine. Um, then there are some questions related to the fact that I used Quemo, not the real hardware. And um, sorry if I didn't make clear that this is just because I'm a lazy guy. I, I used the the emulator, the the quick emulator, because it's much easier to to, to use and to run and to execute test cases and it's also quicker than using real hardware uh, which I maybe don't even have where, where I could um, um, run PyCoS. Um, from, from the use of, of VectorCast it doesn't make a difference. Um, if we run under the cover on the emulator or on the simulator or even in a native environment or if we change the configuration and run the same test cases on the real hardware, it makes no difference from using the tool. It's just a, a difference in where they, the test cases actually run. So, of course, it is highly recommended or even necessary to run the, the test cases on the real hardware in the end at least once. But 
while you build the test cases and look for code coverage and, and try to, um, to, to verify every line or every single line, to execute every single line, um, you don't necessarily have to do that on the real hardware. You can certainly use the quick emulator or any other simulator of your choice and then design the test cases and then maybe overnight change, just change the configuration and re-execute all test cases on the real hardware. So, of course, we can use Vectorcast to run on the real hardware. How this works in detail depends on the capabilities that you have, the, the connection that you have to your hardware, and, and we are very flexible or very configurable in terms of how to connect to real embedded hardware. Um, then there is a question on um, the code coverage that we showed, um, whether this is um, MCDC code coverage. Um, yes, uh, it was MCDC code coverage that I showed, mod um, modified condition decision coverage. Um, um, Vectorcast is used many times successfully in the highest level of criticality in the O178. Um, so we have to provide um, modified condition decision coverage. So, um, yes, this is um, the case. Um, then there is a question on um, how we can help in multi-threading environments. Well, what I showed, or what I at least said, was we, we can um, provide code coverage um, from um, system level testing. In unit testing, you usually don't care about the number of cores, um, and to be honest, it's hard to synchronize. If, if you go to higher levels of testing, it's hard to synchronize um, um, test applications on the, uh, on the real system in, in a multi-thread environment. Um, a colleague of mine usually says that um, the, the, the proof that your application runs correctly in a multi-thread environment will never come from testing. It has to come from design. So um, probably Pico S has a good design to, to, um, to verify or to prove that, that your application runs fine in multi-threading. It's, it's hard to, to prove this in, in testing. And, and so it, it's, it's very likely possible that, that you can configure Vectorcast to run integration level tests in a multi-thread environment and, and um, check um, different behavior on, on the real hardware, um, but the, the question is what, what does it really prove? Um, because in, in multi-thread environments you, you cannot really um, prove that, that everything will always work. Uh, difficult answer. <laughs> um, there was a, a question on timing, whether we can um, provide timing information. Well, yes, we can. And not, not only from the quick emulator, also from the real hardware. And then another question, how Vectorcast differs from other tools. Well, there, there is a static code analyze tool in the question. Vectorcast is um, a tool for dynamic um, uh, code execution. Uh, we, we do have a static code analyze part in our Vectorcast tool suite, but um, our um, competence is, is more in, in executing the code on the real hardware. Um, and to see what difference to other testing tools are, I would highly recommend to do an evaluation or to, to talk to, um, to us, and, and we can maybe show some differences. Okay, that's from me. Yes, thank you, Ingo. Uh, I think we are in time, so it's time to leave now our webinar. I would like to thank our presenters, Chris and Ingo, for their great presentations. I would like to thank all attendees for spending your time with us. We wish everybody a nice day, and we will be happy to meet you again at some of our coming webinars. Goodbye. <laughs>